I've been asked to read two very familiar scriptures tonight. The first one is John 3, 16, and then Mark 16, 15, and 16. In John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he said unto his disciples, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, I almost ran into Trevor this morning, coming up into the pulpit, and tonight I almost ran into Jack. Jack wasn't quite as as intimidating as Trevor was. (laughs) Thank you, Jack, for reading those verses for us, and thank you for being here. And um, I asked uh, Frank this evening if there was any way possible that I could get back down there tonight, because... um, I've got more like a fireside chat this morning than a, than a formal sermon, maybe. And um, he told me, no, I needed to get back up here in my perch. So this is where I am tonight. But I want to be down there with you. I guess there'd be no sense in extending a, another invitation. If you want to come down here closer to me, that's, that's fine. But, um, but I won't hold my breath. I want to look at, uh, at these two passages of Scripture tonight, and I know that they're very familiar to us, but I'm going to be talking about some things that might not be as familiar to you, and I don't make a, a habit of doing this, but in this case, uh, I want to do that. That's why I want to be kind of down there and closer and, and all of that, because we're going to talk a little bit about English Not a lot. We're going to talk a little bit about Greek. And I want you to just hang in there with me just a little bit. We're not going to get too in-depth, but what we learn from this, I believe, will will help us immensely when we talk to our friends um, about obeying the gospel and how very important it is. So if you would... Please, everyone turn to John chapter 3 and verse 16. I know every one of us in here can probably quote that, but I need you to look at it. I'm looking at it up here, and I need you to look at it way down there. (laughs) John chapter 3 and verse 16. The word whosoever... reveals the universality of God's saving plan. The gospel is addressed to whosoever. It's addressed to the whole creation. And as the final great invitation puts it at the end of the book of Revelation, he that is athirst, let him come. He that will, let him take of the water of life freely. Whosoever doesn't leave anybody out. The word believe, the word in some translations, believe F, is a present tense participle. Now, I know we have some teachers in here. Do we have English teachers in here? Do we have an English teacher in here, a participle? Do we know what a participle is? It's important for our discussion tonight to know what a participle is. A participle is, a, is basically a noun that goes into a verb or adjective form by, if you add the, word, the letters ing, the suffix, to the word, it makes it a present tense participle. 
If you add the suffix ed to that noun, it makes it a past tense participle. And you've probably learned, you probably remember that you never want your participles to dangle. All right, don't ever have your participles dangling. Now, your participle can dangle or your participial phrase can dangle. For example, the noun hike. If you put ing on the end of the word hike, what do you have? Hiking, which is a present tense participle. If you would begin a sentence by saying, hiking up the mountain, you have a present participial phrase. Now, what makes that participle or the participial phrase dangle is if in the next words, you have the subject that's unrelated to the participial phrase. For example, if I said, hiking up the mountain, the humidity was exhausting. I dangled my participial phrase because the subject of the sentence would be the humidity. But the humidity is not what the subject should be. Hiking up the mountain, the humidity wasn't hiking up the mountain, I was. So how I would want to say that, perhaps, is hiking up the mountain, I was exhausted by the humidity. There, my participle isn't dangling anymore. What in the world does that have to do with the word believe in John chapter 3 and verse 16? Not only does that have something to do with believe in John 3, 16, but we're going to look at Mark 16, 15, and 16. We're going to see something very, very significant. This word believe or believeth is a present tense participle. So literally... What Jesus is saying to who in John 3, 16? Go clear back up in the beginning of John 3. Who's he talking to? He hasn't stopped the conversation yet. When he told him you must be born again of the water and the spirit, then at the end of that conversation, he, he, he says John 3, 16. And what he's literally telling Nicodemus is that the ones that would be saved are the Keeping on believing ones. If you had a totally literal translation in your lap, that's what it would say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever the keeping on believing ones are should not perish. Because in the present tense, in the Greek language, it continues. It's not a one-time act of belief. In order to enjoy salvation, oh yes, we can lose it. We've got to be one of the keeping on believing ones. Those are the ones that will not perish. Debate people, there's our first point. Okay, the debate, the debate team for lads and leaders, they'll be talking, that's their subject, of losing, can one lose his salvation? Well, we need to get into the subject matter, our dangling participles here. But we haven't even, we haven't finished it yet. Watch this. The belief that God approves in Scripture is not the one-time um, confession that we make or the one-time acceptance as Jesus is Lord. That is not all-inclusive of saving faith. Never has been, never will be. But what exactly is that biblical belief? Some have defined the term simply as an acceptance of historical facts or regarding Christ, acknowledging Him as Savior and Lord, to trust Him as Savior. This is the view of those who advocate the doctrine of salvation, I don't even know how it really can be called this, but it is, salvation by faith alone. Now, the only time that the Bible talks about faith alone is in James chapter 2, and James says that we're not saved by faith alone. 
What has happened in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28 in Luther's version, he thought that that was an ellipsis there in verse 28, and he injected the word only, and since that time, uh, he being the father of that idea, it has taken up some, uh, it has captivated some people, and they teach that, but the word of God does not teach that. The verb believe in the Greek New Testament is the word pisteo. In addition to the acknowledgement of certain biblical data, certain biblical facts about the Savior, it also, according to Liddell, author of a very widely accepted Greek lexicon, adds that the word also includes the meaning to comply, to obey, which interestingly enough, the word a pastio, with an a in front of it, even in the English language, negates what the word is. A pastio means to disobey, but that's a word for faith. That's my point, ladies and gentlemen. You can never separate obedience from faith in the Word of God, ever, in the Greek or in the English. It cannot be done. It cannot be done with God's approval because it messes everything up. And that's why the denominational world is messed up relative to the necessity of baptism in order to be saved. Professor Herman Creamer also noted that faith, pistio or pistis, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, is a bearing toward God and his revelation, which recognizes and confides in him and in it, which not only acknowledges and holds to his word as true, now get it, but practically applies and appropriates it. Saving faith cannot be divorced from obedience slash works. You cannot separate works and obedience from faith is what these lexicographers are telling us. Belief and disobedience many times in Scripture are set in vivid contrast to one another. And I want us to look at some of those verses. And luckily we can do that in the English. Note this verse. Well, let's just look at it since we're there. Look down in verse 36 of John chapter 3. Notice what we have. You know, it's amazing in religious circles, what gets emphasized in John chapter 3 and what gets left out. Man, this stuff is good. You don't, you, you don't hear this stuff on the airwaves. You don't see this in uh, uh, salvation by faith only literature. You, you don't get this part of it. Look down in verse 36 of John chapter 3. Let's, let's, let's read that together. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. The Israelites, similarly of the Old Testament, that were disobedient, were condemned. What does the Bible say? Just what it says here in verse 36. They were condemned because of unbelief. Well, what did they do? They disobeyed. You can never separate obedience from faith. When John 3.16 promises eternal life to him who believes, Hebrews 5.9 attributes eternal salvation to those who what? Obey him. Are those two ideas mutually exclusive, or are they both inclusive, one of the other? You can't separate them. 
The New Testament often uses faith as a synecdoche, a figure of speech where the part is used for the whole or the whole is used for the part. Uh, in, in the Lord's Supper, we drink of the cup. Well, we don't drink of the container, we drink of the contents. But the container is used for the contents, the cup. The world, God so loved the world. Not the container, but the contained. He loved the people in the world. That's a, that's a figure of speech that's used often through the scripture. Well, faith is a synecdoche. Faith is not just talking about one part of God's salvation. It's talking about it all. I cannot have faith unless I do what the faith giver says. I'm faithless if I don't follow that. But in following or doing that, I am working. I'm not following the works of the old law. I'm not following the works that I've come up with. But there is a faith response. You cannot have faith without the response. They go hand in hand. For instance, Paul wrote, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so, aha, uh -huh, there it is. See, we're saved by faith. <laughs> yes, but we're not saved by faith, mental acceptance alone. That's a synecdoche. How are we saved by faith? Is the faith response not included in the faith? Ask any of the ones that were recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 if their faith could have been accepted without the corresponding response. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That this means more than mere mental acceptance is proven by Paul's own conversion. Paul's the one that wrote Romans 5.1, right? Well, guess what? What happened on the road to Damascus? He accepted the lordship of Jesus Christ. Who are you, Lord, and what will you have me do? He understood that he could not have saving faith unless the faith response was there. But religionists today tell us, oh, you can't do a thing. You just accept that fact into your mind that Jesus is Savior and you trust that and everything's going to be good. Satan has not delivered a more damning message than that to religious people. And you and I have friends that believe that. And it's up to us to show them what the scriptures teach even from the original. Paul enjoyed no peace after he accepted or as he accepted the lordship of Christ on the road to Damascus. He was blinded, he didn't eat or drink, and he was not reveling in his salvation at that point. But three days subsequent to that time, when he responded by faith and he accepted what Ananias told him to quit waiting and to be baptized for the remission of his sins, guess what? That's when he was saved by peace and enjoy, or saved by faith and enjoyed the peace of God that he would later write about in Romans chapter 5. Other components in the plan of salvation sometimes figuratively represent the entire process. Repentance in Acts chapter 11 and verse 8 is said to result in life. Repentance only? No. Repentance can be used as a synecdoche. When I change my mind, guess what I must do? Change my life. There's a faith response even in repentance. Now, it's interesting, the inconsistency is seen with many religionists when they say, oh yeah, you need to repent. Man, there's more work involved in repentance than putting yourself in somebody's arms and being baptized. What consistency is that? Paul 
Biblical faith, then, is the faith that lovingly works, lovingly obeys, lovingly responds to the Lord's requirement for implementing the new birth that he was telling Nicodemus. And it is also effectual in maintaining the Christian life. I must be a part of the keeping on believing ones, John 3, 16, in order to be saved. Now, if that word believe was aorist tense, the aorist tense, and that is spelled, see, if I was down there with you, I'd have the whiteboard, and I would put A-O-R-I-S-T, aorist. I know that's a word that we don't use every day, but it's, it's easily defined. The aorist tense in the Greek, just think of a snapshot. We, can, we, we all have cell phones, right? And we take pictures and selfies and all that stuff. All right? And we take a picture of something, and we've got it. It's a one-time act, and we, back when I was growing up, we called that a Kodak moment. But now I guess we call it a cell phone moment or a whatever. But it's a, it's a, it's a one-time act. That's the aorist tense in Greek. And guess what? Now, as we turn over, this is the neat part. We turn over now to Mark 16, 15, and 16. Look at this with me. You didn't know Greek could be so easy. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Do you see the word believe? There in that passage, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. The word belief in John 3.16 was a present tense what? Participle. Indicating you keep on doing it. Not so in Mark. See, and the English really doesn't bring this out, does it? But we can know this. He who believes, that's a one-time act. That's not the continuous action of the present tense of the participle in our previous passage in John 3. This is a one-shot picture. He who believes, literally, the having believed ones, once, the having believed and the having been baptized shall be saved. In the grammar of the Greek, there are rules by which the order of events can be determined. For example, here in this passage, both believe or believeth and is baptized are aorist tense participles, one-time action. The aorist tense has to do with the specific kind. The aorist participle expresses action that precedes the main verb. Did you hear the significance of that? Aorist participles in the original language precede the action of the main verb. What's the main verb in Mark 16, 16? Shall be saved. Belief and baptism are aorist tense participles. Meaning what? You must believe and you must be baptized before salvation. The full force, literally, if we had a totally literal translation before us, would be this. He who, having already believed and having already been not baptized, immersed. Bapti baptism is not an English word. The translation of baptizo is immerse. He who, having already believed and having already been immersed, is the one who shall be saved. 
Note Linsky's clear statement here. Both acts, belief and baptism, would precede the future act, sosthetai. You see, in the Greek, many times there's one word that would, or the English translates multiple words. Sosthetai is the Greek of shall be saved. And what Lenski is saying here is that both of these verbs, and guess what? Lenski wasn't a member of the church. He wasn't indoctrinated in Campbellism. He was honest with his grammar. And he says belief in baptism must precede sosthetai, must precede shall be saved. And we need to note that the aorist participle believes is constant, is a constant force. Well, due to the fact that some religionists are so saturated with the notion that salvation is by faith alone, they resort to various interpretive contortions to try to get around the force of that in an effort to evade what the Bible is clearly teaching here. Typical of this kind of maneuver is probably the most famous Baptist scholar there ever was. His name was A.T. Robertson. Many of you have studied from his New Testament pictures and his, and his grammar books. And he asserted on page 389 in his massive grammar of the Greek New Testament, he said this, Sometimes grammar must yield to theology. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is pathetic. The practical meaning of what Robertson is saying here is this. Sometimes it's necessary to ignore what the text actually says and in its place substitute one's opinion. The fact is this, folks. Grammar is inspired. You don't believe that? When Jesus said in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, finish it for me. I am. Huh. He made an argument on the grammatical construction of the word of God. Jesus, quoting from the Septuagint version, translation, made that statement. Grammar is inspired. The grammar that God, the Holy Spirit, chose to inspire is inspired. What do you mean that grammar must yield to theology? No. Theology must always yield to true grammar. One's personal theology is not inspired. And so, relative to Mark 16, 16, Robertson wrote this. Are you ready? The omission of baptize with disbelieveth would seem to show that Jesus does not make baptism essential to salvation. Condemnation rests on disbelief, not on baptism. Again, pathetic. Dishonest, if you know better. Ignorant, if you don't know better. After introducing the person who believes not, why in the name of common sense would it be necessary for the Lord to list additional items of rebellion? If someone's not going to believe, they're obviously not going to be baptized. Have you ever known an atheist to say, sure, I'll repent and be baptized and continue not believing in God? Wouldn't it be redundant for inspiration to have said, he that believes and is baptized not shall not be saved. Why would he say that?
Elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus did warn of the consequences of rejecting baptism. Did you know that this verse was in there? Turn over to Luke chapter 7, and we'll close with this thought. Luke chapter 7, look at verses 29 and 30. Right after Jesus commended John for uh, being the greatest, if anybody asks you whoever, who was the greatest prophet that ever lived, don't say Isaiah, don't say Jeremiah. Jesus himself said it was John. There's not been born of woman a greater prophet than John. Oh, if we had more John the Baptist in the 21st century, wouldn't that be wonderful? A lot of people would say no. But Jesus gave that commendation to John. Now look at verse 29. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. What's that next phrase? You better yellogize it in your Bible. Not having been baptized. Did the Pharisees and lawyers sin in not being baptized? Did they not realize their salvation because they had rejected baptism? It says here that they reputed the very will of God. How did they do that? By not being baptized. Turn over to 1 Peter 2. This is still part of the same point, so I get one more verse, then I'll stop. 1 Peter 2. This morning, in this morning's lesson, we talked about being living stones and Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Watch this beginning. Let's just look at verse 7. And I want you to see the stark contrast between belief and disobedience. Watch this. Therefore, verse 7, therefore to you who believe... He is precious. But to those, he doesn't say, but to those who disbelieve, what does he say there? Disobedient. You see what he's contrasting? He's contrasting belief and disobedience. You cannot separate belief or faith and obedience. If you don't have faith, then you're disobedient. If you have faith, you're obedient. If you have been saved by faith, you've been saved by obedience. And did you know that most of God's plan of salvation doesn't include a mental acceptance of the salvation facts, namely the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, necessary but not sufficient? I've got to reenact those facts. That's how I obey a death, burial, and resurrection. And if I don't obey the death, burial, and resurrection, I cannot be saved by faith. Did you hear it? Therefore, to you who believe, Christ is precious. But to those who are disobedient, then the condemnation comes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever are part of the keep on believing ones, present tense participle, it keeps happening. But in Mark 16, 15 and 16, he that believeth, Aris tense participle, one time act, and is baptized. Aris tense participle, one time act, both before the main verb, shall be saved. Folks, I've presented the gospel invitation tonight. Who can deny this? If you need to be saved by grace through faith, it necessitates a faith response. Don't be dangling out here with bad grammar or with a bad theology. Grammar never yields to theology. Theology must yield to the truth which includes grammatical construction. If there's anybody that will be baptized tonight, if you have left the keeping on believing ones, all is not lost. You can come back and be a part of the keep on believing ones, and John 3.16 then can apply to your life. 
He so loved you even though you didn't love him when you turned away. And you will not perish if you are in that group. And we want you to be tonight. This song is being sung just for you. Come now while together we stand and sing.